a marketing plan should have two should answer two questions. Okay, so what are your key target markets in order of priority? And in your key target markets, what is your company's sources of differential advantage? And if you don't have the answer to those questions, um, you don't have the you're not going to have the foundation for a solid marketing plan. Welcome to the Schweiki Media Expert webinar series, where we team up with leading marketing and publishing experts to provide you with tips and best practices to help you grow your business and stay on the cutting edge. Welcome to the show. Hello, everyone. I'm here today with Douglas Burdett, and Douglas is the principal and founder of Artillery, a business-to-business -business marketing agency in Norfolk, Virginia, established in 2001. He is also host of the Marketing Book book podcast, which was named by LinkedIn as one of the top 10 podcasts that will make you a better marketer. And prior to starting his own firm, Douglas worked at a Virginia advertising agency for four years after working in New York City on Madison Avenue for 10 years at such industry giants as J. Walter Thompson and Gray Advertising. Before starting his business career, Douglas graduated from VMI, served as a U.S. Army artillery officer in Germany for three years, and then earned his MBA. And today, we are going to be talking about the seven concepts from over 100 marketing and sales books every marketer should know. Douglas, how are you doing today? Hey, good. Good to be here. Thanks for the invitation, and I hope this is helpful for your listeners. Uh, yeah, it, it, absolutely, it absolutely will be. Uh, you know, from a person who definitely tries to uh, continue to, you know, my continuous learning on reading marketing books, and, and but sometimes uh, you never know quite which ones to dig into. Uh, so I think someone who does the marketing book podcast that LinkedIn recognized as one of the top 10 podcasts that make you a better marketer, I am very confident you are going to uh, shed a lot of wisdom for us today. Well, hopefully I can point you in the right direction, and I'm not going to recommend any books that um, I didn't enjoy reading. <laughs> Um, we'll just keep those, yeah. We'll just keep yeah, those most, silent. Most of the books, we've got over 130 interviews so far. And when I started the podcast, uh, David, somehow I didn't realize that when you do a podcast that interviews authors about specific books, you, you actually have to read the book before. Yeah. Then. And um, I didn't realize that. So anyway, I've read all the books, <laughs> and um, it's been really good for me. And there was a post by Mark Schaefer. Uh, the his uh, he's a he's a real marketing leader, thought leader, mm -hmm. author, keynoter, and he's the only currently the only uh, member of the marketing book podcast three timers club. He's oh wow! Cast three times. There's a couple others coming up this summer, but um, he wrote this very interesting post, as all his posts are, and he talked about how there's there's no more there's no longer such a thing as a marketing expert. He said we're all students because mm -hmm. it's yeah. changing so fast. And it's and it continues to change. That really, it's just all about uh, continuous learning. Which is no, uh, there's other industries like that. Just marketing happens to be one where it's mm -hmm. changing a lot, and you really are. A lot of people are struggling to to keep up with what's going on. So hopefully it, yeah, that's. it's difficult. It's daunting and exciting all at the same time. But if you have that attitude, and one like you obviously have, seeing that you're constantly reading, you know, over 100 books here. Um, yeah, it, it's. It's exciting, it's it's daunting, but it's nice to have somebody give you some direction because investing in a book, investing in a blog, investing in whatever is, takes time, you know. And and I I, uh, I treat the books that I read very selectively because I mean I don't have a marketing book podcast, but I like to stay on the cutting edge, and it's tough. And it's funny you mentioned Mark. We just did a podcast with Mark Schaefer, and I ended up. And it just got delivered, um, his content code book that I'm going to read. <laughs> oh, yeah. so, I interviewed him about that on the, on the show. Um, oh, that's funny. In fact, but, uh, we might even talk about that book. Oh, wonderful. Well, I haven't read it yet, but I just got it two days. He was on the podcast last week, so I ordered it right away, and it just oh, came good. in over the yeah. weekend. So it's well, funny you mentioned him. Company, then. Your, your listeners are listening to some good ones. <laughs> <laughs> he was fun. He's awesome. I love to, love to hear him talk. But um, you know, on you know, everything we've been talking about here, I would, first of all, tell, you, know, you can speak a little bit more about your marketing book podcast if you'd like, but I would love your insight. In, in the direction you go to decide on the books that you read, like how do you go about that? I mean, I know sometimes you might be like, oh, made a decision there, made a bad decision there. But in general, though, um, you know, you got to be very selective with with who, you know, what you choose um, to to invest your time in. How how do you go about that? That's funny you ask that. That's uh, I've never been asked that before, but it's something I give a lot of thought to. I try to focus on um, new marketing and sales books. Okay, I'd like them to be new. 
And generally speaking, um, if they come from a major publisher, uh, I want to go with them, and here's why. Okay. <laughs> because if they've gone with a major publisher, they've gone through a rigorous editing process. Okay. And I've had a few, not many, very many, but I, I get pitched a lot now, which is great. Uh, and the, the worst thing about my podcast is having to say no to authors. But um, I've really kind of steered away from a lot of the self-published things because I haven't found them to be quite as good as the, the ones that have gone through a regular editing. And I've, 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 re I've interviewed uh, some authors, and there were some books where they were just, as I like to say, they were written better than they had to be. And whenever I, I you know, compliment an author on how particularly well their book was written to me, uh, they would say, well, I had a really rough time with an editor, or I had four editors, or... <laughs> Mm -hmm. you know, I was starting to notice there was a common thread there. So, um, Also, I want it to be something that a practitioner of sales or marketing uh, would find useful. Um, and uh, so, so uh, you know, there you go. And yes. I, I, those are kind of the ones I, I focus on, the new marketing and sales books, particularly ones from publishers or people that I think have gone through a rigorous editing process. Mark Schaefer, for instance, He's self-publishing now, but I already know because I've read, I think, almost all but one of his books even before I started the podcast. They're just fantastic. So, you know, it's a safe bet there. Okay, very cool. We appreciate that advice because, like I said, time is time is money. And when you invest in a book, it's it's a bit of time, most of them at least. Yeah, you know, um, it's the same thing with me with movies. I don't, I don't want yeah. to see a movie unless I've heard that it's really – Pretty good. And it, Same thing. You know, I don't want to. I don't want to sit there and go, God, I want those two hours. Of no, for time. real though. No, I, I've gotten really big at that going to Rotten Tomatoes, and because I mean, it's a, it's the same sort of thing. You know, you don't get to do this stuff all the time. So when you do it, you need to you need to make sure your your time's going right. So that that is some um, good advice, and it makes sense. You know, it just makes sense. You know, if, you know, new. And the reason I I'm guessing the reason you want to go with new books is because things change so much. And if you get something that's two or three years old, it might have two or three year old information in it. Right, and also the authors are very keen to promote their new books. So a lot of times, I mean, if I had 52 weeks of brand new books, that would be great. That's not going to happen. But um, I scour all. I do a lot of research to see who has books coming out. And then I will contact them, or their publishers will contact me and send me an advance reading copy, mm -hmm. so that I can then publish it the week that they go on sale. Oh. So a lot of the interviews I do are before the books are on sale, um, and I'm, they, they are able to send me something to read, so I get an idea, of, you know, so I can read it uh, and go from there. Well, that's very that's very uh, thoughtful of you to, to to set it up that way, and I'm sure people appreciate. You. What's one of the things people probably appreciate you for, which is why you have such a a successful podcast, but all right. Well, let's well, uh, let's dig uh, oh, in marketing. Ahead. In marketing, you have to give to get. You know. Yep. <laughs> yep. It, it's all about R and R, as Ted Rubin put, puts it. You know, if somebody's doing, you know, if you're asking for something, you better have given something before that, right? Mm -hmm. And not 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 reciprocating. You got to reciprocate before <laughs> before it even happens. And and that's right though. But that's how it should be. That's life, right? Yeah. And uh, it should change. It should be no different than business, which again is just part of life. But um, let, uh, to to kind of dig right in here, you, you sent me over your your seven concepts. So. I'll uh, you know, just state the uh, concept that we, we want to dig into, and then I'll, I'll just let you take it and uh, see what you have to say. But um, I think the first concept you mentioned of, uh, and again, everyone, this is from this is from Douglas looking at a hundred, you know, after reading a hundred marketing and sales books, he pulled out the seven concepts that he feels that are the most important. So you basically have saved yourself one thousand hours of reading, if not more, uh, for what you're about to hear today. So number one. Uh, marketers have an image problem. Yes. Let's, uh, let's have you dig into that. They do. They do. Um, marketers, I don't know, like a lot of people, are very um, maybe not as self-aware, uh, maybe focused on themselves. But um, not too long ago, there was a study by the Fournays Group about the perception of marketers by CEOs. And uh, it turned out that in that study, 80% um, of CEOs don't trust marketers. And that means 20% do. And what they mean by that is that they don't think that marketers they, they think that marketers are too disconnected from the financial realities of their companies. And that's a big, big problem. Yeah. Um, if they think that uh, so, a lot of them think of marketers as people who are arts and crafts party planners who work in the make it pretty department. And they don't sense. I mean, they they sense that there's a cost, but they don't 
they can't see uh, the connection with revenue. And um, so there's a book, one of the books uh, that I, I thought was terrific was called The Twelve Powers of a Marketing Leader by uh, Thomas Barta and Patrick Barwise. And they um, revealed some juicy insights in this massive study they did of marketers and people who work with marketers and people who hire them. And they, they talk about this issue with, you know, marketers talk about things that the rest of the company just doesn't really care about. And uh, so <laughs> they um, suggest that, you know, you, you uh, become more involved in how you are helping to produce revenue. So mm -hmm. um, when I, I gave a talk a while back to a group, a big marketing group, and uh, it was, this is kind of what some of my comments are based on, where they you know, said, what are, what are some things you, you could talk to us about? And I said, all right, well, how about if I come to the marketers and talk to them about that? Meaning, you know, let me give you some ideas, and that's kind of what these seven ideas are related to, somewhat. How to get into that 20% and stay there? Okay. Because if you are a marketer and you find yourself sitting in the back of the cubicle and all you're doing is helping with product sheets and trade show booths, it's not going to end well, and you're not going to, you know, you're not going to be successful in your career. So. What that kind of leads to is um, what was okay, so they've got this image problem that we've talked about, and that kind of leads to the second insight, which is uh, what what goes into a marketing plan. And real real quick, before we t touch on that, I just have a question about this. When you're you're talking about you know eighty percent, twenty percent, are the are you talking about the people who are marketers within their own company or marketing outside marketing agencies, or does everybody kind of fall into that? Uh, that I'm not sure, but I'd have to go and dig a little further, but it's the Fournays group, and it was just a couple years ago where they did this study. So it was, you know, uh, they, it's only 20% trusted of CEOs trusted marketers. So okay, just in I would, general. I would assume it's it's uh, both, but I, we could probably contact Fournays group and ask them. But it's a, it's a very dramatic number, and I hear it all the time, and I think it's one of the biggest uh, problems marketers have, and that's why this book about marketing leadership was so important because it, you know, you're not going to be put in charge, and you have to show certain leadership skills to get the rest of the company on board to help them understand how what you do these days, particularly, is connected to revenue, mm -hmm. and uh, how uh, things have have changed, and those that do that are are very successful in marketing now, based on that massive study these guys did. Well, it makes sense. I mean, I. Can definitely appreciate it. You know, I, I, you know, you're right. You know, marketers might be, oh, look at this branding, look at this engagement, and then, you know, CFOs, CEOs are like, okay, well, where's my money, right? No. So, um, I, okay, well, yeah, as they should, though, as they should, and um, okay, well, kind of solving this, it sounds like you were um, kind of leading into number two, what goes into marketing plan? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So. Um, Malcolm McDonald uh, is a. Uh, uh, British, uh, I think he's a retired professor, but he's still teaching and consulting. And he wrote, uh, I interviewed him about his second edition of his book, Malcolm McDonald on Marketing Planning, which was his 40, 46th book. So he knows a few things about marketing. And uh, he um, he talks uh, in his book, This this it's just a terrific book, he talks about the two questions every marketing plan should answer. And marketing plans, you know, I ask people what goes in a marketing plan. They'll say, oh, an advertising plan or, you know, who our competition is or, you know, uh, a schedule of, uh, you know, news releases or something like that. It's not it. it. A marketing plan should have two, should answer two questions. Now, I'm going to tell you the two questions are, and this whole book is about how to get the answer to these two questions. Wow. The two questions are, what are your key target markets in order of priority. And a lot of companies don't even know that. They'll say, oh, we want to reach everybody, or we think it's this. And they'll say, you know, we'll get whatever we can. But you really want to determine what your key target markets are. And the second is, in those key target markets, what is your company's sources of differential advantage? Okay, so what are your key target markets in order of priority? And in your key target markets, what is your company's sources of differential advantage? And if you don't have the answer to those questions, um, 
you don't have the you're not going to have the foundation for a solid marketing plan. And uh, if you as a marketer are able to get at the answers to those two questions, you are on your way to the C-suite because those two things don't have anything to do. Did you notice I didn't have the word digital? Uh, yeah, I mean because you, that's not the point. What yeah. you're talking. About. Hey, you know what's funny is like I I've always been like, you know, I mean, I understand the importance of forecasts. I understand the importance of marketing plan. I, I I get it. But I've always, you know, had, you know, there's been other certain, you know, I started my career mainly in sales and then it more, you know, went it, it naturally gravitated towards marketing, you know, about 10, 15 years ago. But for a long time it was sales. And I I wasn't the kind of salesperson that was like pie in the sky. Oh, all these great things might happen. I was more of I'll, I'll tell you when they do, you know, and I don't want to like over, you know, state what I'm going to do because it's just, I guess it was my nature of not wanting to let people down or whatever it was. But what that ended up morphing into a problem for me was marketing plans because uh, a lot of it is a bunch of potentially fuzzy numbers that you're almost pie in the sky type of thing. So I've always kind of just. You know, what's we're that? To, or activity. We're going to go to six trade shows. Yeah. Well, Okay. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I so but this book you're telling me I mean and, and just just without even reading this book, just those two key questions and I'm this is not hyperbole, I'm not just saying this, it's it's almost kind of cracked a mental block for me just already. You know, okay, that's where you start, then everything will fall underneath that and naturally. Um Yeah, David, that tingling means it's working. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to read that one. I'm gonna, oh, actually I I already made a note, seven, the next seven books I need to read after the content code. Yeah, well, I'm going to talk about more than seven books, but that book, and it's really refreshing, and um, he he just talks about all that nonsense. And uh, can I, uh, let me quote from just one thing he said uh, about the obsession of marketers with the word digital. He said, almost every course, seminar, workshop today has the word digital in its title. The problem, however, is that unless a company has a robust strategy for what it sells and to whom, it is impossible to have a digital strategy. Without yeah. proper needs-based segmentation, any digital strategy will be ineffective. And he talks about a, a cartoon uh, where it shows the chief marketing officer addressing the board in, in answer to the question about why net profits are down by 30%. The CMO says, yes, that is a pity, but the good news is that our likes on Facebook <laughs> double. Right. <laughs> that's hilarious. Well, I am going to read that one. That that's a it's been a big sticking point, and 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 this is the premier one on developing a marketing plan. I, I yeah, if you want to get in that twenty percent, it it really strips. It's 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 much more about uh, how the the role that marketing plays before you get to the promotion part. You know, you mm -hmm. your listeners probably heard of the four P's, which is a you know paradigm that's still being used. Uh, where marketing is about all about uh, the product, uh, the place, or the you know, how it's distributed, the price, and then the promotion. Well, most people start with the promotion, where in, in fact you should be starting with, you know, the price and or the, the the product, and and actually before that, who is this customer and what's important to that customer? Well, yeah, we'll, we'll get to that. Yeah, that 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 is awesome, and, and you know the you're hearing more and more. We actually had Ann Hanley on here last week as well. Oh. And she was just the next expert in line to say, slow down, everybody. Slow down and do 80% of your upfront work. And then the rest of the 20%, which is what you're talking about, the digital promotion, all that stuff, that, that'll fall in line. But I think you're just the next person that I probably, now I'm up to about 10 other experts in the last two months that I've heard say the same thing. So um, it's obviously something to heed. So, um, yeah, awesome. Uh, do you have anything else you want to touch on there before we move into the third concept? No, that's that's it. It was His book is not a real long one, and it's uh, very refreshingly uh, written. And it was one of the I, – I think it was one of the very best interviews I've had on the show. Awesome. On a side note, uh, well, I can, we can, well, we'll find out uh, at the end where, how to how to follow you and access everything. So we'll uh, talk about that then. All right, uh, the next concept: What is your most powerful marketing? Okay, so uh, 
David, have you ever had a really bad customer experience? Uh, about airlines and cable companies don't count. How about refrigerator repair? Okay. Okay. Now, Very have, frustrating. You ever, have you ever been? Are you at a listener? Ever been so angry that you've taken to social media or gone? Actually, for the first time in my life, literally, first no. time because I'm not I'm not that kind of person. But uh, I did two months ago have such an awful experience. Actually, did go and on social media and to say negative things. And that was the first time I've ever done that in my life, but I was I was that upset. Well, <laughs> so. you're not alone uh, because uh, there was a, a terrific book called Manipulated by Daniel Lemon, and he's a former Google employee and uh, just an expert at online reviews. And his book was great because he explained that, you know, uh, these days, um, you know, a customer, uh, uh, the company, like the company you deal with, with the refrigerator company, you know, they could have blown you off and just said, ah, well, we'll get some more customers. This guy can only tell maybe a couple of friends or whatever. But now you can tell the world. Mm -hmm. And, you know, whether whether you had a bad experience or not, you can still write a, a, a bad review. And this is a whole other uh, set of muscles that the marketers and the companies are having to deal with is, is keeping people happy. And mm -hmm. um, so... It's it's a uh, it's not going to go away. It's best not to ignore it. Um, there are certain ways to deal with folks. Um, <laughs> of course, one of the best things to do is to take good care of your customers and, at minimum, do what you say you're going to do. Uh, again, that's kind of a foreign concept to some companies, but it's it's actually making I think it's making companies behave better. And I'm 100%. the same way. I've, I've taken to social media, but I only only after I've given the business owner the opportunity to fix it. Mm -hmm. You know, and they just completely ignore me. It's like, well, you know what? I've been I've been treated badly, but I at least want other people to know that, you know, what they're getting into. But the the reason I, I mention that is because there have been at least a dozen books on the show about um, customer experience, uh, how to engineer a great customer experience, and it. You know, the, the reason that marketers and, and more progressive companies are focusing on the customer experience is not because they don't like being yelled at, that they, they don't, but um, it brings to mind Willie Sutton, the bank robber, who said that, you know, the reason he rang, he, he, do you know why he robbed banks? Uh, no. He, he told the reporter, they said, why do you rob these banks? And he said, because that's where the money is. <laughs> <laughs> So and that really is where the money is. And there was uh, keeping your customers. Absolutely. Keeping your customers. Oh my goodness! There's a there's a, a number of books, and I would recommend uh, either of, or both of Noah Fleming's books. Uh, one's called Evergreen, and one the other one's called The Customer Loyalty Loop. He's been on the show twice, and it's all about how uh, that's where the money is: is keeping your customers. In fact, getting new customers might actually be a bad idea if you're treating your existing ones badly. <laughs> That's so, quite it's, a concept. It's, I know. And uh, in Nicholas Webb's book, What Customers Crave, he cites some research that talks about how, at least in the United States, 70% of Americans are willing to spend more with companies they believe provide an excellent customer experience. Mm -hmm. And he also reminds you that the probability of selling to a new prospect, based on some research he had, is, is less than 20%. And the probability of selling to an existing customer, 60 to 70 percent. And not to mention the, the loyalty factor. You know, I, I don't know how many times I've read some statistics, I don't have them off the top of my head, about um, when somebody complains, that is your A number one opportunity. I think it started with the Four Seasons owner, if I'm not mistaken. But you, you have, um, well, the concept was started from him, but you have a, an immense opportunity when somebody complains. And and if you restructure your mind that way, you know you have kind of a paradigm shift. It's like great, this is an opportunity, right? Yeah, Be absolutely. because those are the best opportunities you have to to make a brand ambassador. You know how to turn somebody into an advocate. Yeah. And um, I that's how I look. That's truly how I look at it. Of course, some people could be so nasty um, that you decide you don't want to work with them anymore, which is also okay. Mm -hmm. But in general though, that's the outlier and most people are just frustrated. Well, you know, Nicholas Webb, he, he mentions that loyal customers are worth up to 10 times as much as their first purchase. But, uh, what you're touching on there is very well covered in Jay Bear's book, Hug Your Haters. Mm -hmm. And he started out by doing some research and thought, you know, the secret to the customer service or one of the one of the main threads to pull is speed and getting back to them. 
he did this research and found it's not it. That's not it at all. And he then uh, one of the big takeaways from his books is that maybe only one percent of your customers are ever going to complain, and that's feedback that some companies will pay a lot of money just to get from a market research firm. Right. And, you know, in addition to uh, not wanting to tell the world that you're badly, you're bad, but if you get a complaint, it, his book does a terrific job of explaining why that's actually, you really should thank somebody for giving you that kind of, that kind of feedback. I mean, a lot of times, yeah, maybe they're angry, but um, he cites company after company that was able to take their complaints seriously and reverse engineer it and become much more profitable. Yeah, and I, I actually... I read that book, and we actually interviewed him uh, about that book, and I will second that he gives you massive take-homes, massive takeaways, and he does – he goes through the research, which is what appeals to a lot of people because you don't – no matter how great Jay Bear is, you, you'd rather have less of his opinion and more of you know statistical data of what happens, and he applies both. Um, so, yeah, he – why he's a New York Times bestseller, too. Yeah, I mean, it's, it was fantastic. I um, – I actually still tweet him out about that for him because I uh, think it's so helpful. Yeah. And, um, but just to wrap it up, though, this part, the experience you give your customers is the most powerful marketing that you have. So yeah. too many companies think of that last when they really they should make sure that they've got that part squared away before they start trying to fill the top of the funnel with, with more. It's just it will be much more efficient and much more profitable. Yeah, that's great advice. You know, before you start your marketing for new acquisition, um, do your marketing for retention. You know, start thinking about. And you know, and truth be told, you know, you know, content marketing's you know, all the craze these these days. And um, I don't think it's it's going to definitely evolve and change, but I don't think it's going to go away because the concept of it is just so logically sound and solid. I don't I don't see it going anywhere, but. As you develop like that plan for your own customers, then all of a sudden you have your plan for the outside marketplace because well, you can be using content for your own customers. Exactly. Yeah. So you know the, a lot of the tactics you're using to get new customers, mm -hmm. you really should be uh, saying, well, what can we be doing for our existing customers first and foremost? It's easier money, and it's easier to think about. And, you know, it's e it's easier conceptually to. Figure out what do they want to know about. A, you have direct line of communication, mm -hmm. and B, you have your experience with yeah, them. Yeah, they already trust you. Yeah. So, yeah, no, great advice. All right, cool. We're moving on. Number four, 57%. Uh, it's how far B2B buyers are in their buyer's journey before contacting a seller. And I think that might even be on the low end, but um, <laughs> but, uh, but it's still a big me, number. So I'm trying to give everyone some hope. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, so that's a number that I hear all the time. Uh, of course, I gave a talk to about 150 marketers, and maybe only three of them were familiar with this. And so that just tells you that you know people are picking up different information in different places. But hmm. CEB, which is now part of Gartner, did a study years ago, and they're the guys that wrote the Challenger Sale and the Challenger Customer, which were excellent, excellent books. And they did a massive study, uh, and it determined that in a B2B buying situation. Uh, customers are on average 57% through their research, uh, through their decision before they first reach out to any seller. Okay, so in the past, a uh, customer, when they wanted to buy something, pretty early on, they had to go to a seller or they had to go to sellers to start getting information that they needed to make an informed decision. Um, and at that point, the uh, not that David did this, but at that point, a seller could, you know, influence the purchase, and 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 you could you could dole out uh, information uh, based on, you know, uh, you could dole out information and, and extract a pound of flesh from the buyer each time. Like, you know, they wanted the information and you had it, so there was some information asymmetry. Well, uh, people always hated that if they were being sold to badly. Uh, like that. Think of the car dealership. Let me go ask my manager. You know that that kind of uh, mm -hmm. bad uh, meme. And um, so people always hated that. And now you can go online. I mean, think about my wife when she bought a car not too long ago. Uh, the last thing she did was go to the dealership. She was out of town and went to test drive the cars at another dealership. She did all her research online. She talked to her friends. She read reviews. She knew what the dealership paid for the car. 
you know, she knew more about it than the poor guy trying to sell it. So that's <laughs> an example of the buyers. You know, they're in control. They love, they have the information they want, and so uh, a lot of these companies are. A lot of these companies are still saying, "Well, wait a minute. What are we supposed to do? All these customers are coming to us, and all they want to talk about is price now because they've got all the information they need, and we we used to be able to kind of control the situation by being able to give out information. So, uh, and they're like ninjas. You don't, you, they don't even know who some of the customers are until they, you know, pounce and kill them on price. So, what you know, if you think of a, an arrow going from left to right and it's uh, from zero to 100 and 57 percent is you know, just over halfway there from left to right, what you want to do is try to get over on that left side. You want to, you need to be present and relevant. Uh, even though you don't know the customers are going to be there. And that's why um, companies have realized that, you know, they, they can't wait around for the customer to come to them after they've been educated by one of their competitors. Now, now define there. You said you want to be there earlier in the process. Can you, you, can you, be, you need, so in other words, you need to be publishing uh, information that can be found, uh, ideally online and other places, that is helpful for your customers as they're starting their buying journey. Okay. And and uh, would you agree the buying journey, if, to break it down, uh, you know, in a nutshell, is awareness, consideration, and buying, correct? Yeah, yeah those three are often used. Um, I've heard some use too. Um, some like to make, some people like to make it more complicated. Yeah. That's a, that's a trait that marketers share along with other people like attorneys. But the, um, so in other words, uh, the, the concept is, uh, Somebody first has a, a problem, like why is my throat sore? Mm -hmm. you know, they start sim uh, they search symptoms. What, is, what does sore throat mean? And then they do some research online. Maybe they find WebMD or something, and they realize, oh, it might be the the the, the symptoms I'm exhibiting could be strep throat. Okay, so all right, so I have strep throat. I think, how do you go about treating that? And that's where you're sort of in the consideration, like, okay, now I've kind of figured out what my problem is. All right, now, so then at that point, you've, you've figured out, okay, well, I have to go see a doctor, and they have to do take a culture, and I have, probably have to get some antibiotics or something like that, if that's what they have. All right, so then you get to the decision stage. All right, who's a ear, nose, and throat person that's in my area? So that's kind of the, the – they're not starting out looking for an ear, nose, and throat. You know, they're, they're looking for uh, – to solve their problems. So the more that a company can do to talk to a customer's pain points – the more effective they're going to be. Most companies, I'm saying, I think, uh, start out by talking about their own products and services, and that is definitely not <laughs> what people want. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a study I, 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 I uh, saw recently in a book uh, where they were talking about, and I've heard this before, you know, you, people come to your website, maybe only 3% are, are looking to buy at any one particular time. They might be, they're looking to maybe figure out how to hire a company like yours, or they might be trying to find the answer to a problem they have, and they don't even realize a company like yours uh, solves it. I mean, for instance, my company, we're not writing about ourselves. We're writing about how to generate leads. Mm -hmm. That's what people are searching for. Mm -hmm. And you read that, and they start to, to realize, oh, okay, that's, that's how you do it. You know, you're trying to educate them. And then some of them may need help, at which point they're saying, all right, well, maybe we, could, maybe we should talk to this couple of companies. Let's talk to this guy because he's really – provided us with some helpful information, and we, we kind of already know, like, and trust him. Mm -hmm. and then uh, at that point, you at least get the call. And, you know, it's I, I rarely get, years ago, you get a call, uh, meet with a prospect or something, and they'd say, so what can you do for us? They never ask that anymore because we've already built trust on our website. And now it's, what does your calendar look like? Because they already, they already know us. You know, they say, we'd like to talk to you about that workshop you mentioned on your website or something like that. So that's just an example. Much of, more fun conversations, <laughs> right? Well, yeah, and they already know that we might be a fit for them, So, uh, and they found us helpful, and we've established some top-of-mind awareness and some credibility with these folks. So mm -hmm. um, there you go. Yeah, so circling back to what you were mentioning about, you know, salespeople saying, hey, you know, they're just, you know, we're stuck talking about price, whatever. Well, so how can salespeople and marketers work together here? Yeah, so that's where um, you know the, the, we have to pause. I appreciate you asking that. You know, marketers are from Mars and salespeople are from Venus. And you know, uh, in most organizations, um, 
sales and marketing may not have strong feelings about each other, and then there's everyone else. And uh, marketing thinks of the sales folks perhaps as cowboys who don't listen and don't use the material they produce for them, and they don't follow up on the leads that marketing might be generating. Um, and the um, salespeople might be thinking of marketing people as these, you know, like I said earlier, arts and crafts party planners who don't really understand the real world of, um, you know, making a sale, meeting a quota, hitting a deadline. So um, the, the problem is that there's now this gravitational pull that's forcing sales and marketing to work more closely together because, as we've just explained, uh, marketing is having to play a larger role in this buyer's journey. So in other words, in, in, in the past, instead of just generating a lead and handing it off to sales, marketing is going to have to understand more about sales, and they definitely need to understand more about their customer and their problems so that they can help produce content that can either get found online or that the sales team can use to you know, do some outbound prospecting. But basically, uh, I think this is another study from Customer Insights that talked about you know, 74% of companies buy from the company that is the first to provide them with helpful insights. Hmm. It's not about price. So, so yep. that's where marketing is having to better understand that. And that's why in a few companies, they're getting rid of you know, the head of marketing and sales, and they're just saying, look, you, you're in charge of revenue. And the sales and marketing people both work for you. And we want to talk about revenue uh, however you've got to do it. Because the way the buyers are buying is changed. Uh, give them what they want but we've got to close more deals. So, gotcha. Um, now, what, what are a couple of books you suggest to read if you want to dig more into, uh, into this subject? Well, one of my favorites is uh, called The Line to Achieve by Tracy Eiler and Andrea Austin, and it was a really interesting story. They work, it's, they work for uh, Inside View, which is a software as a service company in San Francisco, and one of them's the head of marketing, one of them's head of sales, and they had both worked at companies where sales and marketing were not aligned, and they fought, and they saw how counterproductive that was, and then they worked at places where they were aligned, and it aligned at, 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 at Inside View where they work, they were very much aligned. And they basically told, they tell you what they did to get it done. And they had some real mountains to climb. You know, there were, uh, there were the marketing person, Tracy, or excuse me, uh, yeah, Tracy, she said that at, at the job, she, one job she went to, the sale, head of sales wouldn't even shake her hand as head of marketing oh my because. God. Because they were, they knew they they were going to be fired before long anyway. It was it was like in those war movies where the 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 wow, the don't want to get cool, yeah, quite a culture. <laughs> yeah, and so, but anyway, they turned it around, and and what happens is there was a serious decision study that said that companies that are able to align their sales and marketing functions uh, are getting at least 19% faster growth and 15% higher profits. Now, I would caution that. You have to do a little bit more than just get sales and marketing aligned. There was another book called Valueology, which has been on the podcast not too long ago. They said you you need to get them aligned, but they need to be aligned around your customer. Right. <laughs> there are some companies out there that sales and marketing they're getting along great, and they're, it's not at all helpful for the customer. <laughs> so, they're just going on lots of happy hour retreats to brainstorm. That's right. That's right. So um, the. Uh, let me just mention one other thing about the the, the sales, uh, and this is where you know, the sales and the marketing. Uh, marketers need to uh, steer away from thinking that all they have to do is produce content, and you know uh, people start beating a uh, beating their door down. Just produce the content, the leads will come rolling in. And if you're a salesperson and you're expecting that, you're wrong. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and in uh, so I mean the, the, that helps but you still have to have outbound prospecting. And there's a book by Aaron Ross that he co-authored uh, called From Impossible to Inevitable, and he's the guy that co-authored um, Predictable Revenue, which is the sales bible of Silicon Valley. And in From Impossible to Inevitable, he talks about you know the seven things you have to have for growth uh, in your company, and one of them is he talks about a pipeline. And he was, he took, Salesforce from like zero to its first 100 million. He would never been a sales guy before that, but he was in sales there. And so there's no theory in his book. It's all what works. Mm -hmm. And he talks about these three kinds of leads every company should be pursuing, and he calls them seeds, nets, and spears. And the seeds are like um, many-to-many -many leads, like word of mouth, networks, relationships that you and every employee has in the company. Those are really good things that most companies should be pursuing. 
keeping the relationships up. Which you touched on earlier. Yeah, they're they're, they're warm leads. Um, And uh, so those are seeds. And then the nets are the marketing. Any kind of leads that are generated through any kind of marketing, particularly um, like inbound and content marketing, very, very effective, as you know, and a lot of your listeners may know. Now, the the nets are uh, the quality is going to be mixed. You're going to have some big fish. You're going to have some small fish. But it's going to be the largest quantity of leads you have. And that's why you have to go through them and you know do some lead scoring and, and that type of thing. And the other type of lead that every company should be pursuing, he talks about spears. And those are targeted outbounding, outbound prospects where they're probably happy. They're probably not searching. But if you could have 20 of them, who would they be? And what can one person do to try to get an appointment with them? And keep it going. So it's like a it's like a balanced diet of lead generation. No, but it, it, it's I I am a big humongous believer of that. You know, a lot of times you want the one magic pill. It's like, well, yeah, I mean this will work somewhat, but you know, for many companies, trade shows are just paramount to success. Uh, specifically for certain types of industries where there's like a clothing industry where there's big buyers and stuff. Mm-hmm. So I mean, you got to you got to do that, you know. But then you got to also continuously pick out the specific ones that you want to go after and then, but, you know, make sure you have great customer experience for that other stuff. Make sure you're doing, you know, a digital presence, you know, if SEO is going to bring you business, um, well, incorporate that or, or not if it won't, but you know, content mark. Yeah, it, it's, it's definitely, I, in my mind, I always think, Hey, this is going to help by a percent. This is going to help by 2.3%, you know, mm-hmm. this is going to, and then all of a sudden you, at the end of the day, you know, your 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 percentage grows, and what do they say? The difference between a successful and an unsuccessful company is like five percent. You know, and to um, to Game of inches. it really it really is. But I mean, the, what you just mentioned, I think, is just it really clears things up for people because I think some people want to do this or this or that or that. And yeah, you can't do anything and everything. But the neat the the uh, what'd you say seeds nets and spears all those should apply to almost every single kind of company maybe not like uh, app download type of thing but in general ninety eight percent of the B two B or you know brick and mortar businesses out there you need to be thinking about all of them so uh, I'm yeah, glad you brought that to sometimes the we'll talk here. to companies and they will be doing uh, they won't have much in the seeds and they don't have any kind of spear action going on and they're like oh we're we just want to do the uh, – we just want the Nets part. And that – you know, we're in kind of in the Nets business uh, as an agency, and mm-hmm. it makes me nervous because yeah. it's a, a mismatch on the on the expectations. So, and, and, and what they're paying you. You know, I mean, you can't – you know, you can't just take over anything and everything for a company, and that's why we've changed our marketing proposals to marketing consultation proposals because I'm going to need you to do some stuff. You know, if, you, know <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, you might not want to hear it, but you want to be successful – or you want to pay me five times more than you are, you know, no, right? So let's all get involved here. So, yeah, I, I'm right there with you. And I've recently changed over to, hey, it's consultation too. We need you to be doing certain things if you want to, you know, if we're going to do our job as a marketer, we got to help you point you in the right direction for take advantage of your bandwidth and your mm-hmm. expertise. So that, that's, that's a great point, Douglas, and it's not something that um, – I hear about people talking about very often, but it's something that I haven't even talked about. It's just been my belief, so I'm, I'm really glad you brought that up. It, I think it's paramount. Um, to move on, it's a nice little segue because you've already kind of touched on this uh, content marketing. Yeah. Well, let me ask you something, David. Have you ever caught a mouse before? Uh, uh, unfortunately, Douglas, offline I'll tell you about my uh, my rat Armageddon I went through a few years okay. ago. <laughs> okay. Well, d- if you used a mouse trap. Uh, did you put anything on the trap? Uh, I, I think we had to hire somebody to do it, but I hear oh, what okay. you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> I've yet to meet somebody who caught a mouse with a mouse trap that didn't have something on it that the the mouse trap that the, that the mouse wanted. It. Exactly. So, yeah. Um, it's part of a, the concept here, and we're actually sneaking in lots of others. So if the listeners trying to count up for seven. We're I, we're going to over deliver, but. You know, for a long time, businesses could interrupt their way into the attention of your their prospective customers. There was a captive audience, and you just had to go through a gatekeeper, like a maybe buy an ad uh, uh, on TV or in the newspaper or a magazine. Um, and and you could still, you know, um, you could pitch the media, you could beg them to 
you know, write about you or, or something like that. It still kind of had to be relevant to the readers. But there was a gatekeeper there, an editor, you know, pitching the, pitching them. Or, you know, you could still try to call people, you know, one at a time. Um, but it's harder harder to get, you know, through to them. And uh, the reason for all of that, is, is the reason it's so hard to get through uh, through advertising or, or uh, uh, through the um, direct outreach is because of uh, the, 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 the technology that just keeps evolving at, at avoiding unwanted marketing messages. You know, so you think about caller ID, DVRs, pop, uh, ad blocking software, that's a big one, satellite radio, you know, uh, podcasts, um, remote controls, all that sort of thing. So you really, people are paying now to avoid commercials. And mm -hmm. for more on that, there was another book called The End of Advertising by Andrew Essex, a terrific book, extremely entertaining book. And he talked about how advertising, uh, the interruption model of advertising is, is, is really going away. So um, if you've ever seen the one of my favorite movies, uh, Monty Python and the Holy oh. Grail, oh yeah, the uh, King Arthur and the guys, uh, or the men, I guess you would call them, uh, they come up to this one castle and they said, "Hey, we, I'm King Arthur. Are you, you let us in. We're in search of the Holy Grail." And there was a French soldier for some reason up on the parapet, played by John Cleese, uh, who is really rude to them and says, "You know, go to hell. I, we're not going to let you in." You know. He insults them, and uh, he wouldn't let him in. So I like to think of that uh, soldier on the parapet of that castle. That's the customer you're trying to reach now. You can no longer <laughs> just kind of burst your way in. And they're not going to lower that drawbridge and let you in unless you are of some use to them. So that's why, uh, you know, if you are educational or informational or entertaining, Everyone can produce content now, which is why, you know, the, there's not as many gatekeepers. Uh, part of that is also because the advertising-supported media is just starting to crumble. Um, never going to go away, but it's a shadow of its former self. So that's why companies are realizing that, you know, they can't just be screaming about their products anymore. They've actually got to be producing content that could actually uh, that a customer might say thank you for. Mm -hmm. so an good way to put it. It's a great yeah, way so, to put it. Um, and I heard an expression just today on a podcast I was listening to, a startup guy. He said, is it related to producing content? He said, hey, when you're starting out, don't worry about what ranks. Worry about what thanks. Meaning, are you producing <laughs> helpful content? Because it's ultimately going to start ranking. And, you know, of course, there's other things you got to do. But, you know, uh, content marketing is something that's out there. And, you know, there's a Content Marketing Institute, great website, uh, and the president, Joe Polizzi, he's, he's been on the podcast twice, he's got a great book called Epic Content Marketing, and another one called Content Inc., and you know he defines content marketing as uh, a strategic marketing approach focused on creating and distributing valuable, relevant, and consistent content to attract and retain a clearly defined audience, and ultimately, to drive profitable customer action. And, and I think a big part of that is the, the and ultimately. You know, because it's, it is the it's like a, a net seeds, <laughs> you know, kind of a, kind of combo deal there. You know, to, to get yeah. in front of those people because it's not going to happen right away. But you're 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 looking to consistently, you know, give content to attack and retain a clearly defined audience that will eventually buy from you. Yeah. And I think that that's one of the things that it's funny that he puts it that way because that's exactly what everybody speaks to. Well, and it's 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 actually an old form of, of marketing, um, and uh, so like in that book I mentioned, the end of advertising, you know, he's talking about be the thing, uh, not the thing that sells the thing. Or, or, or another way to put it is um, you have to be interesting instead of interrupting what people are interested in and interested mm -hmm. in. So uh, the the problem, one of the problems with content marketing is that most companies don't have a strategy. They don't really sit through and think about some of the basics of mm -hmm. what, what, what is that profitable action and then how do we reverse engineer that and how do we, you know, it's kind of like Costco. If you ever, your listeners ever go there, you know, you, they have these samples out there at the, on the floor of some of the different food. And the reason they offer those samples and the reason those companies that make that food are paying Costco to sample their product, it moves a lot of product. Yeah, right. So my wife will come home and say, I say, well, what, what prompted you to buy this? She said, oh, they gave me a sample. I thought, I thought it was pretty good. So I was like, 
you know, and it is good. So, but the the, the problem with content is that uh, content marketing. One of the, one of the many problems is that there's so much of it now. Mark Schaefer, who we talked about, he uh, talks about content shock, and that book, Content Code, that you mentioned, started with a post he wrote that got over a thousand comments. Wow. And it was about content shock, and you know, if you ask the guys at Google, uh, Eric Schmidt, I think was uh, I saw a quote where he said that. He's the chairman of Alphabet, which is the parent company of Google, but he talked about how if you take all the information that was ever produced in the history of the world until 2003, that, um, that same amount of content is now being produced every two days. It's crazy. So that's where that, that book, uh, The Content Code, talks about you know, it's, it's no longer build it and they will come. Yes, you have to produce this content that your customers will find helpful and useful and, and, and like you for. Um, but there's you you got you may have to pay to get it shared. You know, there's a lot of other things now that you have to do. Just um, don't. It's not build it when you hit the publish button. That's the starting line, not the finish line. Right. And um, as it related to content marketing, there were uh, just two other books I wanted to mention quickly. One was called Audience by Jeff Roars, and a terrific book. And he, in the book, you know, every one of these books helps to rewire my marketing brain a little bit. And that one really did a good job because he was explaining that. You're building an audience. His book is called Audience. Uh, so as you're creating this content, you have to ask yourself, is this going to help us build our audience or not? Because if you don't have an audience, you can't sell to them. And you should sell to them, but <laughs> first you have to think about building your audience. Mm -hmm. And another uh, one of my favorite, favorite books was by uh, Marcus Sheridan, and he talks about this, what the New York Times called a revolutionary marketing approach, which is basically answering your customers' questions. <laughs> so, right. And it's just, it's so, yeah, well, and I know it works really well, but you know, he talked about how his Virginia, he had a Virginia pool company, fiberglass pools. And so when the real estate market tanked in 2008, people were taking their deposits back, and he was almost out of business. Um, and... He was out of money. They had been spending hundreds of thousands of dollars in, you know, uh, two big markets in Virginia. It was all gone. He was going to have to start laying off people. And at the end of his rope, he said, well, let me try this blogging thing. <laughs> right. <laughs> almost, almost free. And yeah. uh, so basically he started answering every question he'd ever gotten from a customer. Like, what's the difference between a fiberglass? Uh, what are the pros and cons of a fiberglass pool? What is a fiberglass? What does a pool cost? Uh, well, how much water, how much does the water cost? Uh, what, you know, maybe uh, hundreds of questions. And within about a year, as I recall, he had the number one pool site in the world, uh -huh. bigger than the pool manufacturers, because he was simply answering questions. What happened was people, and they have videos. You go there now, riverpoolsandspas.com. You'll see they're trying to, they're, all of their efforts are on educating their prospects. And by doing so, they are increasing the trust of these prospects, and the fear that these prospects have of hiring them goes way, way down. And in his book, he talks about the companies that are really winning at marketing. One of the things they're thinking about is they're obsessed with their prospective customers' fear and trying to remove that fear. Interesting. Yeah, I had the pleasure of seeing Marcus give his very first talk at, talk at Content Marketing World, where it was, it was like the very beginning of his rise to stardom. Yeah. yeah, I was there. It was a small room, and yeah, I actually, you know, uh, developed a relationship right after that. Be, you know, I just went up to him and said, "You were amazing," <laughs> and uh, yeah, so I followed his career the entire time. Get to interview him from time to time, but he, uh, yeah, some of the most basic. Uh, some of the most ingenuitive marketing or, you know, a anything out there that gets developed sometimes is the most simplest things. And, mm -hmm. you know, and from there, uh, yeah, you showed all kinds of graphs of, you know, search engines and getting found and, you know, but you're, what, what are you getting found with now? You're getting found with helpful information that you're helping people out with. So, yeah, he, he has one of the greatest success stories and he continues to stay on the cutting edge and give out. But a lot of this stuff is somewhat logical obviously there's a lot of nuances and details that go into doing it right digitally but in general the concepts are you know very logical and they make a whole lot of sense you know yeah so. i think at, at its heart uh you know you have some empathy for the customer answer their questions um all the other stuff kind of comes to go to the details but it's basically you know <laughs> are we are we being helpful are we building trust you know he likes to say we're all in the trust business 
Mm-hmm. You know, he just happens to be uh, manufacturing and installing pools, for instance. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Exactly, and that just shows you it can work for pretty much everybody. Well, you know so. what else, uh, David? Let me mention. Uh, I know it's <laughs> short on time, but he he's been hired now by to go speak at pool conventions and, and all kinds of conventions. He's a international keynoter now. He said in his book that still he'll he'll talk to a you know a coliseum full of pool people. Only ten percent of them are doing this. Yeah. <laughs> I just I just all I can think of is somebody sitting there saying. Uh, let's see if this internet thing catches on. I think it may be a thing. <laughs> well, that's better for everybody else who's listening and applying in is in the whole continuous learning deal, yeah. which it excites me. You know, yeah. uh, you know, still being uh, young in the in in the new company, you know, growing in. So I, I like that. It's like that. And anybody yeah. else who has that attitude should should look at all this as an opportunity. All right. Well, awesome. Yeah, you're right. We are uh, running a little bit short on time, but let's uh, try to quickly touch on the last two. So my point med- was mice are not attracted to mousetraps. They're attracted to what you put on it, and the same goes <laughs> for websites. And that's a quote from Barry Feldman, who I've had on the show. He's a co-author of The Road to Recognition, which is a terrific book about personal branding. So we'll keep going here. Yeah, I, I, I'm just amazed at how many books you've read, Douglas. I'm, I'm thinking like how hard – how. I try to find time to read them, and you're just spitting out book after book after book well, after book. It's honest, amazing. David, it really has cut into my Scott drinking. <laughs> well, has it though? You can you can drink your scotch and read your books at the same time. Uh, well, the yeah, I can. Uh, <laughs> it goes slower. It goes, it goes faster, um, but I'm a little bit at a loss when it comes to the interview. You know. <laughs> you know, everybody has time for whatever's a priority for them. Yeah. But but it's neat that your priority is this. You know, it's kind of kills a thousand birds at one time with everything that you're learning in in your podcast. So uh, it's a lot of work, but um, I only can imagine how much smarter you've become because of it. Um, yeah, let, let's dig in this last two measurement and improvement, and then top management viewpoint. Let's uh, sure. So uh, the last one was about measurement, ROI. Remember, we still want to talk about that 20%, the things that are important to uh, the boss man or woman. And uh, there was a study by Adobe a couple of years ago that talked about like uh, 76% of marketers thought that marketing had changed more in the previous two years than the previous 50. And so, you know, there's all this turmoil. People are having to learn new things. They, you know, some like it, some don't. Some don't like being held accountable for participation with revenue. Um, but things are more uh, trackable, uh, and you can you can measure a lot more. And that's really, you know, like it was mentioned in building the big data business, the big data driven business by um, I, I, Sean Callahan. Uh, you know, they talked about all this data and measurability. It's like a soldier suddenly being given a pair of night vision goggles. <laughs> it's actually better. Yes, uh, it's it's new, but it, it actually is better. One of the things that back to that book I mentioned, Line to Achieve. Uh, they they talked about pipeline, measuring pipeline. And we're, you know, don't measure Facebook likes. Measure pipeline. And what she means by what they mean by pipeline as you would know from your sales days, it's different from leads, but it's it's leads who have expressed uh, an, an interest um, and, and actually there's an actual opportunity that, that that's qualified. So you're, you're, you want to look at your pipeline, and pipeline would be qualified opportunities. Keep looking at that. Don't look at the leads. Look at the pipeline. What are the qualified opportunities? That's a great one to start measuring. And, of course, there's so many things to measure. Um, Another thing, another book that's really terrific was by Michael Brenner, and he wrote The Content Formula. And it's got all the math that you need to start measuring the effect of all this content marketing. And it's it's a lot of math, but it's basically like addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. And I had to take a year of calculus in college. It's It's not hard math, people. Um, and you have to go find the, the numbers to put in, but the content formula is a great one. If you start applying what's in the content formula, you're going to find yourself closer to that 20% that we talked about. And there was another book by Paul Ratzer who wrote the Marketing Performance Blueprint. And, you know, again, terrific book. And he, he says, if you can't measure it, don't do it. So figure out something that you can measure. And, but another point that he had in his book that I really liked was he said uh, – he talked about social media, which, again, you know, 
the digital thing, and he, he, he mentioned that social media reach is a deceptive metric that can give a false sense of progress. So, you know, social media reach versus pipeline, I, try to measure your, your sales pipeline before you start measuring, focusing, obsessing about your, your social media reach. And um, just to uh, quote Peter Drucker, who uh, a lot of, you know, marketing and sales books, book readers will know about, famous, uh, famous uh, management guru, he always said, what gets measured gets improved. So just the fact that you're measuring things is a good thing. However, another uh, fellow, uh, another American who spoke with a German accent, uh, Albert Einstein, uh, he said not everything that counts can be counted, and not everything that can be counted counts. So I know I'm talking in circles here. You're not, though. You're not, though. Yeah, no. I mean, you're just driving home the fact that it's very important to, I mean, what, what do they say, you know, measure, track, and, and, and adjust, you know. And if, if you're not doing that, if you're not looking at that, well, you have, an, you have room for improvement. And you're not just going to be going, you know, looking at the wrong things because it's easier for and better for you because what that's going to, you know, accidentally move you towards is that, you know, for, you know, one of those four out of five people who aren't trusted by the people who will pay your bills. Yeah, so yeah. it's uh, getting ahead is getting started, and just start measuring things. Just yeah, you'll be surprised. You'll be yeah, surprised. yeah, no, no. So you're not talking in circles. You're just driving home that fact, and and I appreciate it. And um, it's it's important. It's very important. Uh, anything left before we move on to the last point? No, but let's go to that one quickly because I yeah. I fear that I've frightened the listener and I've, I've brought the marketers down, but there is hope. There is All right. Well, give us the hope. The tunnel. Okay. Number, number seven, top management viewpoint. Yeah, so there is hope for marketers. And um, in that back to that book I mentioned at the very beginning, The 12 Powers of a Marketing Leader, um, they talked about how uh, they, they analyzed all these people that were successful marketers, and basically they all had one thing in common, and that was a top management viewpoint. So you could have been a marketing major who graduated last year. You can have a top management viewpoint. So, you know, in other words, rather than talking about marketing, they, these people talk about the business as a whole. They have a strategic approach to it. They don't talk about, you know, branding and uh, they, they talk about revenue, you know, profit, uh, things like that. So um, the other thing is that you know always keep working on your skills as a marketer uh, and don't don't become complacent because they talked about how 21st century mar 21st century marketing is suffering from a skills crisis and a lot <clears throat> I've, I've said it seen this several times where they say marketers that know what they're doing like some of the things we talked about in this in this interview um, they're going to be their salaries are going to be doubling in the next five years. But that's because there's such a shortage of people that are familiar with some of the things we talked about here, the, the future is quite bright. But there's one other reason that I wanted to share with you, um, and that is that a silver lining for marketers, the role of marketer is becoming a training ground for CEOs. So, you know, successful marketers have pretty deep insights into their, their customers and the competition and how to pull the revenue lever, how, to, how the company makes money. A lot of CEOs, a growing number of CEOs, are starting to come from the ranks of chief marketing officers. And according to Gartner, who we mentioned earlier, that's going to continue. I mean, you look at McDonald's, their CEO, he was the CMO. All this information that a marketing person now has to have, it's just, it's a very short leap to become the head of the organization because you're so familiar with the customer, the competition, how to make, uh, how the revenues happen. And you could look back. A lot of CEOs in the past would have come from manufacturing or the product side. And then there, there, and then there were a lot of them that came from finance and accounting because there was, it was all about uh, wringing out savings. And, and those were good things. And now you're starting to see uh, the marketing is becoming the, the, the big differentiator. So it's, a, it's just one more reason why it's such an exciting time to be uh, working in marketing if you can hang on. Right. Or you can apply yourself, too. You know, you got you got to dig in because I mean, you mentioned lots of different things in the in, the, in this interview today. Um, none that I disagree with. Not that, that you know means much necessarily, but I, I you know there's lots in here. But you gotta you gotta do all of this stuff, and you gotta get good at good. You gotta get good at all of it. But if you do, and it's attainable, you don't need um, you know uh, you know a mental level you know sort of 
intelligence to to grasp all of this, but you got to have you know you got to have the willingness to roll up your sleeves and get it done. But but it's all right there, you know, it's all yeah. right here. You and know, also you, the other thing to keep in mind is the idea of you know the joke about when you're being you, when you and your friend are being chased by the bear, um, you don't have to outrun the bear, you just have to outrun the other guy. Mm-hmm. And so you know you don't have to have all it's just the secret to get ahead, getting started. If you just start to do some of these things, you'll start to see uh, um, the, uh, a, a positive reaction. And uh, there's still just so many companies that are uh, you know resistant to this and resistant because they're just not familiar and they, this isn't what they they do all the time. So and that's the, that's really you hit the nail on the head. That's normally what the resistance is all about is just the unknown and not understanding. But once you start to dig in and you do understand, then it's just going to be a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, awesome. So uh, give me one big prediction you have for the marketing industry leading us into 2018 and beyond. Hmm. Predictions, predictions. Um, I think you're going to start to see, uh, whether marketers are li- like it or not, you're going to start seeing marketing have a greater presence at the leadership table uh, of companies. So All like right. I said, the big ones, the CMOs are becoming CEOs in many instances, but even at the the smaller uh, uh, smaller companies where they realize they may be really squared away on running their business, but they're uh, it's, it's kind of like there's a, the, the era of marketing where they really are starting to appreciate it. You know, even in my career, I, I sense that in the past maybe we were more like vendors. I, I came from an advertising background, as you mentioned earlier. And now the conversations I'm having with clients in the last X amount of few years as we've moved into this area, it's more like the conversations I have with my accountant <laughs> or my mm-hmm. lawyer because it's just so much that we have to keep up with. And they're like, great, I, this is what I want to accomplish. You come back to me and tell me what we ought to be doing. Yeah. I think that's a good thing. Yeah, it's a great thing. Well, awesome, Douglas. I enjoyed this. You've given me a lot of homework, which I uh, – do and don't enjoy, but it's a necessary evil and, or excitement because a lot of this stuff um, I'm very excited to, to get better at. Uh, h- how can we all continue to learn from you? So uh, the website is marketingbookpodcast.com. You just put in marketingbookpodcast.com, and it goes to that section of our agency website that's all about the podcast. Uh, listeners can connect with me on LinkedIn. My, uh, or excuse me, my Twitter handle is uh, marketingbook, marketingbook. And uh, we can also connect on LinkedIn. My name, again, is Douglas Burdett. And if anyone has any questions or are looking for some um, book recommendations, if I can help point you in the right direction, it means all those hours of reading those books. <laughs> <I'll> <laughs> even more. So Awesome. Work. And we can find that Malcolm McDonald one on the com. Yeah. You have, all the, you have all the archived ones there as well. Yeah, what I can do is um, I can give you a link that goes to all 100 whatever interviews and people can just look through there and see the perfect sounds great all right douglas until next time sir my pleasure good to be on all right thank you